I'm going to be uh, talking today um, about some work that I'm currently doing, uh, still in progress, on interactions involving people with aphasia and problems that arise in those interactions. Um, I'd also like to quickly acknowledge um, my collaborator in this work, Professor Alison Ferguson from the University of Newcastle. Okay, so for those of you who aren't familiar, aphasia is a language disorder resulting from damage to the brain, um, to the areas of the brain that process language, usually from stroke. Um, aphasia affects the ability to understand language, to use language, uh, to read and to write, um, and generally other cognitive capacities are unaffected by aphasia. So essentially, if you're the person with aphasia, you've got someone who is basically the same person they were before the brain injury, but they just can't use language as well. Okay, so placing that in an interactional context, um, what that's going to mean is that you can have an asymmetrical distribution of semiotic resources in that interaction. One person having more access to uh, language than they Now, for people like me, psychologists, physiologists, um, we're interested in conversation um, for a, a couple of reasons. Firstly, it tells us more about the linguistic abilities of people with aphasia. So it tells us more about the nature of aphasia as a language as well. Secondly, it tells us more about um, the consequences of aphasia for everyday life. So, how does aphasia affect this person's ability to live their life? With that information, we can then better tailor um, our treatment approaches to um, the language abilities of people with aphasia and how it affects their life. Okay, so based on that description I've just given you of aphasia, it should be relatively clear that aphasia is going to have some sort of effect on the likelihood of trouble arising in inter interaction and the need for repair. Um, aphasia simultaneously uh, increases the likelihood of trouble um, and also um, diminishes the resources available to deal with trouble. Uh, specifically, people with aphasia are going to have trouble self repairing their own time uh, and it's going to increase the efficiency of other repairs. So other repair becomes a more widely used resource, a more effective resource than uh, self-repair in many cases. Um, the other consequence of, of this ongoing kind of trouble arising is that it draws attention to um, the identity of the person with aphasia as aphasic, as different, as linguistically common. Um, and often um, trouble becomes the primary business of the interaction, disrupting whatever else is going on. Okay, um, other repair has um, received <coughs> probably a fair bit of attention in the aphasia literature, um, and particularly uh, looking at uh, instances where uh, people, conversation with people with aphasia, recurrently present um, formulations and candidate understandings of what the person with aphasia is saying and doing. Um, and this is being termed a keeping guess sequence. So we get lots of candidate formulations, little bits of more information from people with aphasia, and that process goes on until we just have to um, pedagogical correction sequences can also arise where um, conversation partners um, try and get people with aphasia to produce the word in a certain non erroneous way, even though they know what the word is. So um, the interaction itself isn't being held up by anything but the correction. And there's also been a little bit of um, work on the absence of other repair in interactions involving people with aphasia. So where conversation partners basically just ignore what the person with aphasia has said or done and keep on doing whatever else they do. Okay, so uh, there's this relatively ugly diagram that I've made here. It's very bad. Um, it's not intended as a, uh, a system diagram of all the possible options for responding to troublesome at all. Uh, it's just more of a nice heuristic for our purposes today um, to show the phenomena that I'm going to deal with. Um, so, upon encountering some troublesome talk from a person with a data, a conversation partner can either choose to respond or not respond to that talk. They might decide to initiate repair, and they could also decide to do something that's not repair, so a non repair in response. And that's what I'm going to be looking at. So, these are the three kinds of responses I've identified in my data so far. Um, just looking at the wider conversation and all the research that's relevant to this work, uh, Jefferson has done a little bit of stuff on advocated on the correction, whereby uh, a recipient of a potentially correctable turn passes over the opportunity to correct it. So this is quite a cute example from uh, an interaction between Jefferson and her mother, um, where Jefferson passes the opportunity with the uh -huh there to correct um, that. And she gets the wonderful uniquely conversation and the pleasure of living through this sort of state. 
So yeah, uh, she basically uh, just attributed this to various sorts of recipient disengagement with the ongoing talk, be it some sort of topic or basically some sort of effective analysis. Okay, um, Justin also talks about uh, repair and correction um, as I'm joining this room.